from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station! Hi, and welcome back to Education Station. I'm your host, Alex Milanese. Education Station is a show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we're getting three fun lessons about history. So our first stop today is with Mr. Allman, who's going to show us something called History in a Bag. Let's check it out. Good morning, West Virginia. My name is Brian Allman, and I'm a sixth grade social studies teacher at Buchanan Upshur Middle School in Upshur County. I'm also the 2019 Milken Educator from West Virginia. So today I'm going to be talking about an activity called History in a Bag. So as you can see here on the table, I'm going to have three different bags. Each of the bags is going to be full of artifacts. Now artifacts is a word that we're going to have to talk about. An artifact is anything that is man-made that sort of gives us an indicator of what that person or what that group of people may have done. So in a thousand years, anything that we're using today will be considered an artifact. Just like when we find things today from ancient civilizations or from, you know, hundreds of years ago, we're studying those to figure out, you know, how that group of people or how that civilization lived. So today there's going to be artifacts that describe certain people in these bags. I'm going to be pulling them out one at a time. We're going to do it three different ways and then we're going to talk about who that person was and how we came to that conclusion. For this first bag, what we're going to do, I'm going to pull the artifacts out one at a time. And then as you can see here on this sheet that I've created, and you can do it on a, a separate sheet of paper, you could do it on your phone, whatever you decide to do, you're going to make a guess after each artifact is pulled out of the bag. You could do this with your brothers and sisters, your friends, your mom and dad, whoever you may be at home with. And it could be like a game. So you could get the bag ready and they could guess. And what they need to do is make a guess after each artifact. So I'm going to start to pull these out and then you make a guess after each one. So the first artifact that I'm going to pull out of this bag is a horse. So I'm going to sit that on the table in front of me. Then what you would do, if you can guess who this is about, based off that one artifact, you would take an educated guess and rate it right here. It's okay if you don't get it right, you probably won't get it right. That's probably not enough to figure out who this bag is about. The second artifact is this army man. So again, I'm going to set it on the table in front of me. You're going to make your second guess. The third item that is in the bag is, are these leaves. These leaves are going to tell us something important about a person. Take a guess on your paper. The next artifact is a pen. I'm going to lay it down. Make your fourth guess. By this point, people may or may not have an idea about who it is. We'll figure that out at the very end. The last artifact is a teddy bear. So see if you can figure out who it is based on these five artifacts, and then we'll go over it in just one second. All right, we're back. If you guessed that our first bag was about President Theodore Roosevelt, you can see a statue of him here behind me, uh, you would be correct. So we're going to briefly go over why these artifacts represent him. Horse, he was a lover of animals. It actually leads us into the next one. He was in the army. He was the leader of a group of people called the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War. He was also responsible and was big into conservation. He set up many national forests, national parks. You know, we still enjoy things today that he was responsible for setting up in the United States. I threw in a pen because he was a well-known writer. He wrote over 35 books and 150,000 letters in his lifetime. I mean, just think about that. If he lived in today's time, he would be a, a YouTuber, a TikTok star. The last one was this uh, teddy bear. The teddy bear obviously is named after him. He went on a hunt in Mississippi. They tied up a bear and asked him to shoot it and he refused. He had somebody else do it. So that was our first bag about Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, everyone, we're back up front for our second bag. We're gonna do this one a little bit differently. We're gonna empty out the entire bag and then work together to try to figure out who it is. Our first artifact is a bus. Our second artifact is a pair of handcuffs. The third, a $5 bill. Our fourth artifact is a magnet of a place called the Lorraine Motel. 
Our next artifact is a calendar from March 1965. And the final artifact is this poster that has the name Michael on it. Now, we're going to work together to try to figure out who this bag was about. You may have to do additional research if you don't know. You could do that on the internet. The person who made the bag could also answer questions, sort of like 21 questions, if you don't have the internet and need to do additional research to try to figure out who it is. This particular bag was about Martin Luther King Jr. Our first artifact was the bus because he was one of the main players behind the Montgomery bus boycott during the Civil Rights Movement. Our second artifact, the handcuffs, were because he was arrested 29 times. And that sounds crazy to us today, but a lot of times he was arrested for things he should not have been arrested for. Our third artifact, the $5 bill, was included because it has the Lincoln Memorial on the back. This is where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his most famous speech, the I Have a Dream speech. Our fourth artifact, was the uh, magnet of the Lorraine Motel. The Lorraine Motel was the location of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in 1968. You can still go here today. It's the site of the International Civil Rights Museum. Our fifth artifact was the calendar from March 1965. That was the date of the march from Selma to Montgomery. It was led by Martin Luther King Jr. in response to a police killing of an African-American man, as well as, you know, the people being prevented the right to, to sign up to vote. And then our final artifact was this um, poster that says Michael. A lot of people don't realize this, but Martin Luther King Jr.'s birth name was actually Michael. He changed his name. His father actually changed his name. Several, several years later, he was a pastor in the Baptist church. He had visited Germany. That is a place where he was able to visit, you know, important places throughout world history. One of the places that he was able to visit was Wittenberg. He was able to see where Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of the Catholic Church in Germany, which protested the church and really led to the Protestant Reformation. So that was it for this bag. Basically, if you wouldn't have known who this was about, you could have taken educated guesses, and that is called an inference. An inference is where you use evidence and things that you already know to come up with a solution. And that's what we were able to do here. We were able to infer that this bag was about Martin Luther King Jr. We're gonna talk about our third and final bag. The third and final bag actually has nothing to do with one particular person. We're gonna empty all the contents and figure out if we can figure out who it would be about. So the first thing in here is a bottle of hand sanitizer. We have a ruler, a grade book, an ID badge, a dry erase marker, and a textbook. So obviously we could talk together and work together to make an inference, that's the word we talked about earlier, in order to sort of analyze what we already know, we're probably gonna come to the conclusion that this bag is for a teacher. This could be a bag that would be used to describe any teacher. So what we're talking about here really is historical process. Who the bag is about isn't necessarily as important as the rationale that we used to determine who it was about. We want to start to analyze why things are the way they are so that we can understand why things are happening in history the way that they do. It's going to give us a greater appreciation of why things have happened and it really can help influence our actions moving forward. Okay, after doing our activity with the bag, that can lead us to another social studies concept which is really important. We're gonna talk about primary and secondary sources. A primary source is where you look at artifacts, pictures, you know, autobiographies, things that actually were written or taken at the time that an event took place. A secondary source would be something like a book that is written about the person and sometimes incorporates primary sources. But we really can take what we learned in the bags and take it a step further. So for example, here are some primary resources about Teddy Roosevelt. We have a campaign poster and we have a picture of him as a rough rider on his horse. You know, an example of a primary source document for Martin Luther King Jr. would be the transcript of his I Have a Dream speech. Now, in regards to secondary sources, that's going to be things such as books. This is a book on the American presidents. Obviously, Theodore Roosevelt would be included. We also have a book here. Martin Luther King Jr. is on the front cover. He obviously is referred to a lot in this book, but it was written after the events took place, so that would be a secondary source. 
I hope that you enjoyed the activity that we did today. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is the letter B. I want you to understand that social studies is the best. You can be brilliant if you learn about our past. You can help shape our future. It's a beautiful thing because you'll be able to make a difference and it will be blissful because it makes me so happy to know that you are the future of our state. Social studies is anything but boring. I hope that you learned something today. I appreciate your time. Make sure that you wash your hands and stay healthy. Thanks, Mr. Allman. Now, in that segment, you heard a little bit about something called primary and secondary sources. But next up, we're going to get a deeper dive on this topic with Ms. Perry. Let's go. Hi, everyone. I'm Ms. Perry, and today we're going to talk about primary and secondary sources. Let's review first. So a primary source is a first-hand account or piece of evidence of an event in history. I like to think of this evidence as being created or written at that time, and most often that is true. However, there are certain sources like memoir, written uh, by a person about a particular part in their life, or an autobiography, a history of that person written by that person, or even oral histories are recorded after the fact. And so we have to remember that it's still about the person that took part in that event, but it's written years later. Uh, also, we need to remember that primary sources can be written or visual text as well as artifacts. Now, on the other hand, secondary source is a document or a written work created after an event, and it's typically through research. So now that we've reviewed Let's take a look at some different primary and secondary sources, and we're going to practice to see what we learned. If you want, go ahead and write down 1 through 12, and all of the artifacts are going to be either primary or secondary source. If you're not going to write them down, try and see what you can remember, and then we're going to go over our answers when we're done. All right, let's get started. Number one is a textbook like this. Number two is a letter. Number three is a cell phone, the object itself, not necessarily what we're reading on it. Number four is a painting. Number five, biography. Number six, a memoir. Number seven, the newspaper. Number eight, a history book. Number nine, a movie. Number 10 is money. So that could be either cash or coins. Number 11, a novel. And then finally, number 12, a magazine. All right, let's see how you did and review each one. So number one was our textbook here. Our textbook is a secondary source because it's written with lots of different research, um, often different authors as well too, bringing together all of their information about events, people, ideas in history that happened long ago. All right, the second one, number two, is a letter. And a letter is a primary source because it's written by that person at that time. Typically, you wouldn't write a letter about some secondary research unless you're maybe a historian writing to another historian. But very rarely <laughs> would that happen unless it's like an email today. Most often, if you're sending a letter, that's going to be a primary source. Number three is a cell phone. 
the cell phone itself is actually a primary source. It's a piece of technology that we can study that will tell us more about the way that we lived our lives. If you were to go to the Smithsonian today, they have entire exhibits about technology where you can see different types of trains, different types of cars. So the object itself is primary. Now, on your cell phone, you may read secondary information. Like if you go to Google and then you click on a website about some event in history, you're reading a secondary source, but the object itself is primary. Number four is our painting. And a painting would be a primary source because it was created at a certain time. A biography is secondary. I happened to pick out the book Hidden Figures. Uh, Katherine Johnson grew up in West Virginia and then eventually became a mathematician, went on to work at NASA, and she just recently passed away. This is created through research and getting to know those individuals. And most importantly, it's written by somebody else. Okay, so not somebody who partook in those events, but actually did the research and got to know these people to write the biography. Number six is a memoir. This memoir is by Catherine Manley, and she grew up in West Virginia as well, too. And this is her story about growing up in West Virginia and in poverty, uh, and then eventually went on to graduate from high school and go on to college. These are her experiences while she wrote about those experiences after the fact, she still was the one who participated in those events. That's why this is a primary source. Number seven is the newspaper. In the newspaper, most often you are going to see primary sources. So what happened the day before or what is going to happen that day? Say, for example, if you watch a high school football game, typically the next day in the newspaper, they're going to do a recap of what happened at that game the night before. And so this is most often a primary source. Do newspapers sometimes provide secondary articles like maybe a history of the town? Yes, they do that occasionally, but by and large, a newspaper and the articles within are primary sources. Number eight is a history book. This is um, the history book about the number nine mine disaster in Farmington, West Virginia. This was written through a lot of research. She looked at oral histories, she looked at um, newspaper articles, she looked at government reports, and she brought all of that information together, mostly primary sources, to create this secondary source based on research. She did not take part in the event and she wrote it afterward. Number nine is a movie. And the movie is a primary source. It's really a work of art really. And it tells us what was interesting to us at that time. It shows a little bit of our culture. Number 10 is money. It's a primary source because it is used at that particular time. And money has changed over centuries and years. Even the United States currency has changed over time. The thing that's interesting about money and why we can really start to see why it's a primary source is because money often has a lot of symbolism in it. Say, for example, images of our past leaders. And say, for example, the coins um, here on the quarter uh, years ago, we started doing different um, images to represent the different states. So it actually records for historians later what is important to us. Number 11, a novel is a primary source. Now, novels are interesting because it's written by a person typically who didn't take part in any event. And what's confusing is when we talk about historical fiction, the book is still fiction, it's still a novel. But even though it's fiction, it still can be used as a primary source because it was created at a certain time. So it tells us what may be interesting to us in our culture at that time, maybe themes in our culture that are interesting or pertinent to us. And so we have to remember that a novel is technically a primary source, even if it is historical fiction. And then finally, number 12 is a magazine. 
Now, this is the one where it could possibly fit into two categories. Like for example, the Golden Seal is a magazine that presents lots of secondary sources. So lots of different articles about things that happened in West Virginia history. But another magazine that was produced today, and maybe it tells us a little bit about a certain area or maybe something that's going on in our world today, that is a primary source. Thank you for talking about primary and secondary sources with me today. Uh, since we're doing these during the pandemic, I want to end by asking you, living in this time period right now, which is so unique and so different, what primary source do you think people will use to study us 50, 100, 200 years from now as they examine the COVID-19 epidemic? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Perry. Okay, our final history lesson of the day actually comes with a cool art lesson attached. To find out more about the history of Pablo Picasso, let's go visit Miss Roselius. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the art of Pablo Picasso, one of the greatest artists of all time. Pablo Picasso was born in Spain, but spent most of his life in France. His father was a painter and an art teacher. And his mother said at one time that his first words were to ask for a pencil. Isn't that amazing? I don't think those were my first words. He started learning art from his father when he was very young, and he had a good foundation of learning the basics. Look at this drawing of a camel. He was able to capture the idea of the camel in one single line. That's pretty incredible. Later in his life, he was able to create several new types of painting and sculpture. One of those types was called cubism. Cubism, if you, if you hear the word cubism, cube is one of the words of cubism. And that is where the painting was split into several lines and geometric shapes. If you can see in this painting, it is split into lines and shapes. Now we've learned a lot about the elements of art over the last several weeks. Color, line, shape, and form are all present in Pablo Picasso's artwork. But this week we're talking also about space. Here is one of his paintings where he also used the element of space or creating the illusion of depth. It looks like a very simple painting with line, shape, and color only, but if you look at the flowers in the hand, they look as if they're being held by the hands. One hand looks like it's overlapped in front of the stems, and the other hand is holding from behind. Artists use this technique of overlapping to create space in their art. We'll be making a bouquet of flowers similar to Pablo Picasso's Bouquet of Peace. Here is an example of what we're gonna be doing today. And here are the supplies that you're going to need. You're gonna need a piece of paper, a black marker, and some crayons. Hi. Hi. Joshua's gonna help me out with the video today. Yeah. So when uh, you see a hand in the video and someone drawing, that's gonna be Joshua's hands. So he gets to be the teacher today. He's pretty excited, if you no, can tell. All right, let's get started. Uh, if you have all your supplies, um, go ahead and set it up and we'll get right to our uh, Picasso-inspired bouquet. Okay, so go ahead and get your paper and we're gonna use your Sharpie marker. Joshua has his Sharpie marker and we are ready to go. What we're going to be doing first is tracing our hand. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is trace your non-writing hand. Whatever hand you don't write with, that's what you're going to trace. And you want the thumb to be pointed toward the top. So you want the thumb to be up. So see how Joshua's, he's tracing his left hand because he's right-handed. So he's tracing his left hand and his thumb is pointing toward the top of the paper, okay? And then we're gonna want the, your arm to go off the edge of the paper. And Joshua's also going to trace not just the hand, but the arm that goes off. We're gonna go all the way off the paper. Okay, go ahead, Joshua. I'll do mine and you can do yours. Make sure your thumb is pointing toward the top. 
Good. All right. So Joshua traced his hand. The thumb is toward the top. And now he's going to take his marker and um, draw some of the stems for the bouquet. Now, because this is Space Week and we're talking about space and how we add depth to our pictures, one of the ways we do that is by overlapping objects. So our hand is going to be um, in front of the stem. So we're not going to draw the stems in front of the hand. The stems are going to look like they're behind the hand. So we're going to draw, starting at the top of the hand, we're going to draw a kind of a line, not all the way toward the top, but stopping, yep, good, um, stopping not quite at the top, and then go down like you're jumping over the hand and start at the other side of the hand and make that line go down. Yep, that's one stem. Good. Now I'll do, I don't know, four or five more stems, just like that. Go ahead. Up, and then jump over and continue it at the bottom. Up, jump over, continue it at the bottom. Good. What about you, Mom? Can I just show you? Yep. Yep, Joshua had a good question. He said, what about um, in between the fingers? If your line goes behind and you want to do in between the, make it look like it's going in between those little fingers, you're welcome to do that. Once you get five or six really nice stems for your bouquet behind the hand, then... Um, We'll move on to the flowers, but finish up those stems. And before you put your marker away, we're going to go ahead and sign it like Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso signed his artwork at the bottom right of the paper with in black. So I just want you to sign in your cursive? name. You can sign it in cursive or in print, whatever you know how to can do. We, can we do our initials? Um, uh, let's do your name. He did his last name, but you're welcome to just do your first name. So go ahead because, um, you may want to give this to someone special. So go ahead and just sign your name at the bottom with your marker before you put your marker away. All right, I'm closing up my marker. Joshua, are you ready to close your marker? Nice job. All right, now we're ready to color. Uh, so I want you to grab four or five different crayons and you're going to color um, some large circles at the tops of your stems, just like Joshua's doing, and then pick a different color and make some just short little lines around it, just like Pablo Picasso did. Joshua, you might want to make your flower part a little bit bigger to make it just a nice big flower up on top of those stems. All right, so he's gonna pick some different colors. He's gonna keep working on his. You keep working on yours. Okay, we are finished. I hope you are finished with yours, um, with your Pablo Picasso inspired bouquet of peace and to give to someone special. Um, and thanks for joining us, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Ms. Roselius. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank all of the teachers who submitted their awesome lessons. And we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.